Hi everyone, welcome to the Saturday webinar. We've shortened our time format, so we're just going 1 to 145. The topic for today for our UTA new teacher webinar is teacher blogs getting started. And it's actually focusing on the teacher as a blogger. It also focuses on learning through blogs. So for instance, reading other people's blogs. Our hosts are myself, Dr. Peggy Simmingson, and Justin Dellinger, Marla Robertson, Harrison McCoy, and David Sparks. So let's give the presenters a virtual round of applause. You can say hello or welcome or hi or whatever you want to say. Um, and then our goals for the webinar are for you to learn and get ideas, but also for you to share ideas. So we'd really like for you to give your input by asking questions along the way. There will be a main Q&A at the end. Um, however, however, please feel free to type in the chat window and we'll check it throughout the webinar. Just so you know that our webinars are recorded and we have all the information on our YouTube channel, our SlideShare channel, which I just shared the link for. We also have a Facebook page and a new blog, which I'll mention momentarily. So tell us where you are right now. You can use the pen tool to make an X on everything, or you can tell us in the chat window where you are. So we'd love it if you just kind of take a minute and tell us where you're at. We've got Fort Worth. Let's see if we're mostly in Dallas, the Dallas Fort Worth area or for outside of that area. Got some Arlington, Colleyville, Fort Worth. So mostly Dallas, Fort Worth area. Mesquite, Mansfield. Well, welcome to everyone. Great. Excellent. Okay, perfect. So Today's session, there will be voting tools, and let me just point out where they are. The voting tool will be under my name and next to the hand tool. You can also, um, you'll either have A, B, C, D, E voting or yes, no voting. And so again, the voting tools next to the hand tool. We'll do a few polls. There's also an emoticon tool, and so you can do smiley face, LOL, virtual applause, approval, thumbs up or down. So these are ways that you can participate. We encourage participation in the webinar. So let's start with a poll. Where are you in your teaching career? A through E, are you a pre-service teacher, first through third year teacher and UTA grad? Are you a first through third year teacher and non-UTA grad, fourth and year and up teacher, or are you something else like faculty? So go ahead and vote. It's right to the right of the hand tool. So I'm faculty, so I'm going to select E. You can also feel free to type right in the chat window, for instance, if you're on a mobile device. I'll go ahead and just our voting results. Okay, so we're mostly um, pre-service teachers and we also have some faculty and other. Okay, great. Welcome everyone. So again, our, these are our presenters and if you look on the SMORE link, you can read more about our bios. I'm just going to post that link if you want to look at that later. It'll tell you a little bit about ourselves. We're all affiliated with UTA, either as faculty, staff, or a graduate. Let me share about blogging, our topic. So we have a new blog, and we are looking for guest bloggers. You can see that our blog is um, dedicated to new teachers, but the topics are of interest to everyone. So we've had people write advice for new teachers. We've had people write about behavior in the classroom with tips and strategies. We've had first year teachers write for us. We've had fifth and sixth year teachers write for us. Harrison, who's on our blog today, has written 
for us about technology and pro, sort of pros and cons of the flipped classroom. If you decide to write for us, we'll list you on our blogger's um, guide. And on the blog, there are tips for blogging. And also, you can access our webinar recordings here. So does anyone think they might like to write for us? Um, let us know. You can type it in the chat window. And you can write me. I'm Dr. Semmingson, and it's Peggy S at uta.edu. Or go to utanewteachers.com and click on Tips for Guest Blogging. So um, I'm actually going to turn it over to Justin Dellinger in about 30 seconds. But let me run down the ideas about blogging. Some basic topics we'll cover are free versus paid blogging services. Um, the UTA blog is actually a paid one. We pay a small fee to host our service, and we have more, kind of more options with it. But there are certainly some free ones, like WordPress or Blogger. Those are popular. Some people use Tumblr to um, start a blog. And so there's just so many different things to consider when you're blogging. And so I'm going to put a link in the chat window. and. I will, sh I will share this um, by saving the chat window file at the end of this. So you can consider, what platform do I want to use? Do I want it to be highly visual, like Tumblr? Do I want it to be more text-centered? Do I want to share some media? That, those are things you might want to consider. This third point is you can read blogs to learn. You can also read and comment. And reading and commenting on other people's blogs is a great way to start. And then you can work up to writing your own blog. Um, what do you guys think about blogging? Um, pick one of these questions to respond to in the chat window. Let's see what you guys think about this topic. So either what are the benefits of being a teacher blogger? Or what blogs do you want to read? Or do you read? Or just tell us if you do read any blogs at all. They don't even have to be teacher blogs. And we will take a look at your thoughts in the window. And our moderators and presenters can also type in the chat window. Kind of why blog? So um, we'll hear more from Dr. Sparks in a minute. He says, I blog for sanity. <laughs> Sometimes it's really good to express your thinking because other people are feeling or thinking or experiencing the same things as you are, kind of gives you a feeling to connect. Dr. Robertson says, being a teacher blogger forces you to reflect on why you do the things you do. So reflection, I see. Blogging, you can share and learn from other teachers. Great. And um, Alicia says, I think would be you get feedback on your ideas. Yes. So people will. Sometimes just random people on the internet will come across your ideas and tell you their thoughts. So those are all great. I'm going to turn it over to Justin, and then we'll hear from Marla momentarily and Dr. Robertson in a few minutes. Okay, Justin, you're on. Hi, all. Uh, so I am the research coordinator for the Learning Innovation Network Knowledge Lab. Um, so we are a research lab at UT Arlington. And um, so one thing that we are kind of looking at right now is the possibility of um, instituting something called a domain of one's own here at the university. And uh, one thing with that is it's give people, whether you're faculty, staff, or student, the opportunity to, um, to, to have their own space where they can have their own artifacts to keep. Um, because when you use the blog system in a place like Blackboard, um, when you finish that course after 30 days at UTA, you no longer have access to your course. So um, one thing that if you if you have an outside source that you're using, um, such as Reclaim Hosting, which is what I use for mine, I'll show that here in a minute, it allows you to have an artifact that you can retain past um, the end of the course date. So um, I'm going to put one thing in here. It's something that I also do. And I'm going to go ahead and share. This is a link to the history course that I run. So um, in addition to being the research coordinator for the lab, um, I also do teach uh, large history courses fully online for our academic partnerships program at UTA. And um, so I'm going to share this. Okay. 
So in addition to using my course as a blog, um, I also use it as a place that's sort of a course home, um, sort of like this uh, neutral zone where people can all come to one spot to get their information that's not necessarily housed inside the LMS. So um, in my blog, I also have um, my Twitter feed for my class, so I have a unique Twitter um, hashtag for my courses, things that I like to share, students have the ability to do it too, uh, links to our class Facebook page, um, our course calendar. I use Google Calendar. Um, it's the way that people can go and they can add to their own um, as well. And then, um, you know, being able to get into the Blackboard uh, LMS, because I do have to have a lot of my assignments in there, and then uh, visual syllabus. So um, the visual syllabus is another way of being able to see the course um, ahead of time. So this is great for onboarding, um, because sometimes you can't get your Blackboard course open until pretty soon ahead of time, especially if you have these, um, my courses, we have academic coaches. Um, so we don't even get those assigned. So normally I'm opening the course on Saturday or Sunday, course starts on Monday. So this is a way for students to be able to get some information ahead of time. It's not just, um, you know, you sending out um, an, uh, an email with your source attached. So some things like this, um, I like uh, visual things, um, sort of as a flow chart. So I use, I think, the chart for this one, kind of give them an idea how the course flows. Um, I also have, again, the course calendar, assignments, and other things. So it's, it's all broken up into different um, different ways. So I find this to be pretty useful. And I modeled this a little bit after a MOOC that we ran last year, a uh, data and learning analytics MOOC. Um, and we're going to have a second version of that coming up uh, next fall. So as you can see, we have a kind of similar way of being able to break it up. So, you know, the different competencies, you can go and you can click here and you can see. So. Okay, great. What service are you using for this? Okay, so I am using um, Reclaim Hosting. Um, I do pay for mine, um, but we are working with uh, Jim Groom and uh, some of those right now with uh, Reclaim Hosting to see if we can bring that um, to have a larger impact at ETA. So where we may be able to pay for some people's accounts and then they eventually have a lot more. So yeah, I paid, yeah, about 45 years, that sounds about right. So I have full control over my content. So I use mine for EdTech blogging and also for my history courses as well. So um, I do pay for mine, but I use a WordPress. Um, I, use, I use WordPress, and then I have a number of plugins that I do. What's cool about that, too, is um, there's a nice plugin um, that allows me, it's uh, called Jetpack, to be able to, um, if I want to send information out to my class, um, I can send it out through Twitter, through Facebook. You know, there's a lot of different ways to do it. So. Um, I definitely like uh, Word, WordPress, so okay, great. It's a, it's a pretty cool thing, and yeah, I think I'm pretty close to my time here. So, <laughs> oh, awesome! That's great. And um, yeah, so what Justin's talking about is the university is thinking about rolling more of a your own domain space, and so that would be something that's truly like a digital portfolio. You could blog. There's lots of features, so stay tuned for that. So that's called a domain of one's own. Um, so it's a neat idea, and it's really great, so thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Marla Robertson. Um, and as each speaker presents, if you want to say thanks or something that stood out, you can do that too. So Dr. Robertson is a literacy professor, and I'm going to turn it over to her so she can just jump into her content. OK, so um, I would consider myself a novice teacher blogger, but I do have in the past tried to incorporate blogs in some of my courses, particularly if the focus was on writing. But one of the things that I always, um, that I do do is I follow quite a few teacher bloggers. Um, so on this screen up here, I'll, I'll go ahead and um, put in the, put some of the links for these in the um, chat box. But um, these are most of them local area DFW teachers who blog. Um, the first one is that I'll share is Empathic Teacher. And this is, her name is Jennifer Iskett, and she teaches English in Keller ISD. And she has been blogging probably for the last two, two and a half years. And she blogs about a lot of different topics, but a lot of it has to do with um, things that are happening in her English classrooms. She's working some with, um, Harkness discussions um, and focusing her her inquiry within her own class is on dialogue, incorporating more dialogue in the classroom. 
Um, and so she talks about that sometimes, but every once in a while she'll put something out there about, you know, I'm really frustrated today about something or other. But, um, you know, so she doesn't only do teacher things she uh, that are that are curriculum types. Also, she does other, you know, things that help teachers. Um, another one I follow is um, called Librarian in Cute Shoes. And this actually is a teacher who, it, she was a teacher, an elementary teacher. But um, she is now a librarian, and she works in Cup Hill ISD. But when she was an elementary teacher, she was a fourth grade teacher, and she had a classroom blog. Um, and I tried to see if it was still up there. She's been a librarian for the last couple of years. But she used to blog um, a lot for the purpose of her students being able to get access to things outside of school, and also for the parents about what they were doing in their classroom and things like this. And so hers is, um, her focus right now mostly is on books. So children's literature and um, young adult literature, and when she gets to go to conferences and gets to meet authors and you know some of the fun things that she does as a librarian. Um, another one that I follow is called um, Nerdy Book Club, and this is actually started by Donalyn Miller. And if you're familiar with her book, um, the, the Book Whisperer, and she has another one out, um, Reading in the Wild, I think. She actually used to be a teacher at Northwest ISD. I think she also taught at Keller ISD before. Um, so she's upper grades. I think she taught like fourth, fifth, sixth in um, those grade levels. Um, but she works for Scholastic now. But she and one of her fellow teachers, um, I think he's in Michigan. His name was Colby Sharp. Um, they started this blog probably two or so years ago. And they mostly share they mostly were sharing children's literature that they really loved using in their classrooms and about how they used it and what they were using it for. And since then, it's really kind of blossomed into a, a quite a huge following. Um, they actually blog every day. Um, I, it's a great blog for uh, children's books, authors, young adult books that teachers are actually using in their classrooms. Sometimes there's a little bit of a book review. Sometimes they talk about how they used it in their class. A lot of times they'll do top 10 lists, like the top 10 best books for, um, you know, whatever kind of topic it is that they're sharing for winter or, you know. Um, so there's a lot of really good resources on there if you're looking for um, children's literature and young adult books that you can use in your classroom. Um, another one that I follow that is a local group is called Three Teachers Talk. Um, this one, it, what used to be three area teachers um, from Louisville ISD, Carleton Farmers Branch ISD, um, and Capel ISD. But since that time, um, it's expanded. So now one of the teachers that, it, that regularly contributes is in California. I think the other one might be in New Hampshire or New York or somewhere. Um, but they are uh, secondary teachers who use a reading writing workshop in their classroom. And so they blog about different parts of, you know, how they're working with Reading Writing Workshop, what kind of things they do, what things are working, um, things like that. Um, and I love that one. Uh, the teacher, um, Amy Rasmussen, is um, a Louisville ISD teacher. She's the main local one that contributes. Um, and she also does Reading Writing Workshop and AP courses and has choice reading and AP courses, which is kind of interesting, an interesting way. Um, not as often used, and so she shares about what she does in her classroom. Um, those are the main ones that I have on here. Uh, then there's some other ones that I that I follow, but I'll go ahead and switch to the next screen. All right. Another thing um, I do that is very helpful is I have gotten on Twitter. I'm not really a Twitter type person, but I do use Twitter a lot for educational purposes. So the only reason I use Twitter is to follow authors and educators because many of them blog and they will they will put links to their blog on their Twitter feeds. Or they have websites and whenever they put something new on their website they'll put um, something out on their Twitter feed. So I think um, Twitter has become a really um, cool professional development tool for myself to follow what's going on out there. Um, one of the reasons I really like following blogs and doing these kinds of things on Twitter is because it gets you out of your own school that you're in in your own district and lets you see what other people are doing outside of um, your own small area. And there's a lot of really innovative teachers across the country that are doing just some really great things. 
um, I just had taken a picture of my Twitter feed. One of the people on there is Colleen Graves, um, and she was she's a high school librarian. I think she's in um, Denton ISD, but she's really big into maker spaces. Um, so when people are really passionate about something and they put things out there to share, it's just really kind of amazing the kind of things that you can learn about um, by what people are doing on Twitter. And you can also find other people to follow um, on Twitter. All right, go ahead and go to the next one. Um, another way, and that's some of the other blogs that I follow are associated with professional organizations. Um, I do think this is another way to, to help your learning go outside of your own district, and that is to join a professional organization. Um, NTCTELA is the North Texas Council of Teachers of English Language Arts, and it costs like, I don't know, it's not very much to join. They have a, a conference every June. It's usually the second Friday in June, and it's a one-day conference, and they bring in some really big names literacy people um, to come and talk. So I got to see, I've gotten to see Penny Kittle and Ralph Fletcher and some of the really well-known names. Um, so I would highly recommend looking that one up um, because it's local. And then TCTELA is the Texas Council of Teachers of English Language Arts and they have some resources on their website. There's a new one called TAIL, Texas Association for Literacy Education, and I think that one costs like five dollars to join. It's very inexpensive. Um, you can go to their website, um, but the the one that I follow blogs on is NCTE. So I'm on. I follow a blog role on there, and so I get a, a an email every day um, of different things that people are discussing um, about what's going on in their English classes, or they ask questions. So you know, if you have a question in your own classroom, you can post something on there, and you'll get people from all over the country that will give you advice <laughs> and answer your question. It's really kind of an amazing. Um, tool. Um, also, the International Literacy Association, there's some um, blogs and things on there that you can follow. Those are really good ways to expand your um, repertoire of places that you can learn from. Go ahead and go to the next one. Uh, Dr. Robert, right. we, ha we had a quick question um, in the mm -hmm. chat window, and so we'll pause right here just for a second. What do you think about this question about using, cell, someone asked about mobile tools and cell phones in high school, it's kind of a more general question. I think it's becoming a lot more um, acceptable, um, particularly if you have teachers and a district that, uh, that allows that kind of thing. Um, most, most students now at that age have a cell phone or some kind of a smartphone. Um, and so rather than trying to fight the fact that they're trying to use them, you try and incorporate, you know, things, things that you can do in your classroom that, that helps them use them for a, a useful purpose. So I, I'm great. okay with it. I'm, I think. Me too. Yeah. Okay, great. All thank right. you. Okay, the last few I was just going to say, there's a lot of really good and fairly easy sites to use for blogging. Like I said, I'm kind of a casual blogger, but I do have, I did start a blog called Mother of All Readers. Um, so I post every once in a while about things that you can do as a parent to help your kids read or if something happens with one of my kids that has to do with something about reading or writing, um, I'll post something out there about it. Um, so that's just the last, um, one of the things that I posted out there was about um, something that one of my cousins was posting something on Facebook and was posting pictures that I had never seen before. So that's a picture of me on the track when I was little. And yet he posted some pictures um, from me when I was a baby in my grandfather's lap. And that grandfather had passed away but when I was two. So I had, did not have that picture. And so um, I just wrote something on there about how important it is to connect with our family and, you know, um, have the opportunity to write about stories from our old pictures. So. And um, that's that one. And WordPress is actually fairly easy to use. One of the ways that I learned how to use it was I, I Google how do you do this on WordPress. And it's amazing what you can find out there. Um, I'm pretty much self-taught um, because there's so many resources out online where you can learn how to do those kinds of things. I'll go ahead and switch to the next one. <clears throat> I also have another blog, and this is a personal blog. I, I recommend that if you're going to blog, uh, both that you set, have different ones. They don't necessarily have to be on different platforms, but I just, this one is on um, Blogspot or Blogger, which is associated with my Gmail address. 
So this one is more of a personal one, and it is also really easy to use. Um, I think you just need to be brave and get out there and, you know, try it. And I, one of the things that I need to be better at is setting goals about how often I want to blog, because I would like to blog more often than I do. It's just it's one of those things that it gets pushed down on the list. Um, all right, one more. There's another one that's pretty easy to use, um, and it's Weebly. Weebly also can um, you can use to create a website for yourself. So I'm kind of playing around with creating a website um, to put my professional um, documentation on. But you can, you can also um, use Weebly as a blog. And one of the ways that I've used these three these three sites, so WordPress, um, Blogger, and Weebly, are three that I've used in pre-service teacher classes to have the pre-service teachers create their own blogs. I've also um, used kid blogs and edgy blogs, but I found in a pre-service teacher class it's better for them to actually create an actual blog that they could continue to work with after they're done with the class, kind of like um, just was saying when it's in Blackboard it, it loses access to it, but um, because it's a real, it's a it's an authentic place that can that you can publish authentic writing for a real audience, real purpose, you know, and you can, um, so getting teachers started, at least playing around with it, so that when the time comes, they have a little bit of comfort level on, you know, not, not quite as afraid of, of trying to approach doing something that on their own. So. Okay, great. We love it. Okay, thanks so much. And we like the, the variety of platforms that you've shared with us. Today, somebody asked a question, great question about group blogging, and so you can do different things with that. You can have um, many people on a group blog, like a class, you know, many students, and you, we talked about Edmodo last time, so check out our recording from last session about microblogging in a shared space. There's something called Kid Blog. I don't have the link, but um, students as young as first and second grade are using them. Also, as professionals, you can get together with four or five other people and kind of rotate the post so that we were just talking in the chat window. You know, sometimes we forget and we neglect our blogs. And so if you have a group blog, I just put an example in. Um, these are some literacy professors, and they have one called Literacy Beat. And I don't know how many people are on it, but it's like, I think it's Oh, four or five, it's like uh, maybe six, and they focus on technology and literacy, and you can subscribe to it. So a lot, of, it's really great if you have a little pop-up window that says subscribe whenever there's a new post so that people don't have to keep checking it. And I subscribe to blogs that I like to follow, and so they're really great because then you get notifications in your email. So that's my main tip is subscribe to blogs. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Harrison McCoy, and take it out. You can take over with the slides and speaking. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm going to take sort of a question and answer approach to this, and and think about some questions that that I remember asking when I started blogging and, and getting ready to do that. And so the slides that I have are, are kind of built around those questions. Some things that I think ought to be considered as we as we start blogging. For example, uh, think about why you're blogging and, and some ideas about why uh, you might do that. As an educator, uh, I think it becomes, uh, and, and I've got eight listed here, and I'm not going to read the whole, read all eight of them, but I'm going to comment on a couple of those. I think when we think about sharing our best ideas, um, we educators are a remarkable resource of ideas and, and best practices and strategies for our classrooms. And I think there exists a little bit of an obligation to share those with our peers, and a blog is an excellent way to do that. Uh, it becomes, for me, a training tool. I am a, a technology trainer on my campus, so my blog sometimes serves the purpose of sharing ideas, whether they're mine or, or other uh, educators, uh, to be able to, to help train my peers and, and give them ideas that they can use in the classroom. Um, I also think that it becomes a great way to model uh, the skills that I want my students to use. I teach a computer information applications class, 
but writing is my background. I taught English for about 10 or 15 years uh, before going into to technology this year. And, and so writing is still a part of my classroom, even though it's technology oriented. And uh, my students do a weekly blog post and maintain a blog. And they write about and reflect on what they're learning, uh, both in my class and in their other classes. And so my blog becomes a way of modeling for them, because they know that I blog. And, and, and I think some of them uh, read my blog occasionally. And so it becomes a way of, of, of helping demonstrate some, some best practices there for them. And, and it enables me to, to kind of stay ahead of them a little bit at that. And uh, I also tell my students that when they blog, and um, when they write that it should be publishable, because it is published once it goes on the web. And uh, this last item on my list, the idea of showcasing student work, my students know that at times I'm going to ask them for permission to reprint their uh, ideas on my blog. And, and I have not done yet, that yet this fall. Uh, but as we move into the spring semester, uh, I expect that some of their blogs will have had a chance to grow and develop enough uh, that, that I can do that and, and that they'll have some, some real quality things. So uh, it, it does become a place to, to showcase their work. Uh, I think we need to decide what we're going to call our blog. I, I think that's a very relevant question. Um, the title that you give to your blog uh, becomes a way of marketing or branding what you're trying to do. And that's either a positive or maybe a negative thing, uh, depending on what you decide to call it. Uh, I do think that it should be, uh, when I say memorable, I guess the best word uh, there would be, a, the best word choice there was not memorable, but, but rather an easy to be remembered name. Uh, because the longer your blog title, the more difficult it is for people to remember how to find it. And so thinking about what you're going to call it uh, relates to what you're going to try to accomplish and what you're going to be writing about. And, and I think it does need to, practically, it does need to uh, have that quality of being easy to be remembered. Then deciding where you're going to post your blog. And, and we've already talked about that in, in some other discussions. Uh, a real wide variety of options are out there, ranging from the free ones uh, to some that, that may have fees attached to them. Uh, I personally, at this point, use uh, Blogger. And, uh, and mine is a blogspot.com blog. Uh, I like the format. It's free. And uh, I am playing a little bit with WordPress right now. And, and probably in the next few months, we'll, we'll convert over to a WordPress blog, uh, simply because I think from a professional standpoint, uh, that might be a little more acceptable. It, it's sort of like uh, I get asked every now and then about teachers who have uh, things like Hotmail email addresses. And professionally speaking, uh, I've been told by principals, you know, that sends up kind of a red flag. It just doesn't sound very professional. And that Gmail, or, or at the very least, a Yahoo kind of email address may communicate that you're paying attention to your, your digital footprint out there. I think the host site for your blog uh, may go some ways a little bit toward communicating how professional you are in terms of what you do. So I think it does matter where you decide. And, and that's the point of this, this slide is just that it, it does matter where you put your blog in terms of who your audience is and what you're trying to communicate with that. And there's a link at the bottom of this slide to some more information about that. Now, how are you going to decide what to write about? I, I've seen some of the comments in the uh, uh, chat column here uh, thinking about you know, how difficult it is to get a consistent habit of writing. and. And, and, and developing that sort of, of um, pattern, um, I think a lot of people get scared that they won't know what to write about. But we're, as I said earlier, we're tremendously creative people as educators. And um, when I think about uh, what we should be writing about, I think people as a whole read blogs for several reasons. Uh, I think that looking for creative solutions to challenges that we face in our classroom, that's one of the reasons that I read about blogs. And sometimes I find that I get solutions before I even realize that I have the problem or the challenge to solve. And so at some point, that becomes an idea that's just filed back away, and I get a chance to pursue it later on. Uh, I think sometimes we're looking for the courage to be innovative. And it helps to know that other people are actually doing that out there. We've got a great idea, but we're a little bit shy. 
and we're wondering if it really is something that would, would be a best practice. It may be a best practice after it's been tried a few times. And so innovative people, I think, are looking for ideas and encouragement there. Uh, sometimes we read and we write just to be entertained and encouraged. Uh, the last slide that I have lists several blogs that I read regularly, and a couple of those I read mostly because of the entertainment value. Uh, they are professional and educators write them, but these educators happen to take kind of a devotional approach to their writing, and um, they connect the, the world around them to their profession in a way that it kind of motivates me and makes me smile, and sometimes that's important uh, or as important as, as reading for academic reasons. And I think sometimes I'm looking for understanding to help deal with complex issues. Uh, there are some, some very serious educational reform issues uh, that are, are, are finding their way into uh, our, our workplace these days. Uh, things like uh, homework versus no homework, grades versus no grades. And sometimes I want to try to understand the implications of those issues that are very complex and not easily resolved, but they have a direct effect on my classroom. And so I know people who write about those things, and they're good resources for understanding those and thinking through those complex issues. And um, again, there's a, a little note, a link at the bottom of this slide to help uh, with this idea just a little bit further. I've got a poll here that you might consider doing just for our, our own purposes today. It, it is active on polleverywhere.com. And if you were to type in this link, um, you could give us some insight into helping understand maybe why you read blogs or why, if you're not a regular reader of blogs, why would you read? Uh, and, and I think as a, as a blogger, I would like to know what people in this part of our country, particularly here in Texas, are thinking, uh, and especially as we think about free service teachers in the group. You know, why would you read a blog? And, and that's going to go directly to the idea of what I write about and how can I help uh, I decide what I'm going to write about based on that. I think when it comes to consistency, uh, the Nike slogan is not a bad idea. Sometimes you just have to do it. Uh, I don't do much jogging or running uh, anymore these days, but I remember at one time reading in a runner's magazine that often the most important step you take in, in, in running or exercising is the one that turns the doorknob so that you get out of the house and go do it. I think at some point, you just have to set up a schedule and start writing, whether you think you have an audience or not, because it may be that in the very beginning, you're writing for an audience of one. But I think you'll discover, as, as other people begin to find that you do have a blog, uh, you will build an audience. And, and it will matter to you what you say and how you say it. But, but in the beginning, it's just a question of, I mean, maybe I'm doing this for me, at least at the start. And so I just set up a schedule and go to work with that. Now, this is, the, um, this is the list of blogs that I read kind of regularly. Uh, I'm going to mention two or three of them. Uh, the fourth one in the, in the row there, uh, John Harper's blog, is one of those devotional ones that, that I was talking about where uh, he is an educator, uh, but he has a way of kind of connecting with the world around him in a way that just encourages and motivates me. Um, the Free Tech for Teachers blog, uh, Richard Burns' blog, is just a tremendous resource uh, for technology integration in the classroom. Uh, he is very, very giving and free with uh, a lot of things, uh, a lot of great ideas there. Uh, Cult of Pedagogy, um, that's one that I, I probably frequent uh, real regularly because uh, the author of this uh, actually develops podcasts based on her blog posts. And, um, and maybe it's the other way around. Maybe the, the blog posts are the scripts for her, her podcast but she has some really interesting uh, topics sometimes to deal with there. Um, if you want to go international, four up from the bottom, uh, Mr. Kemp NZ, that's New Zealand. Uh, he is a, a very prolific writer and writes uh, with a, a different world perspective, being on the other side of the globe. And that's kind of fun, too, to see how, how other teachers and, and educators think and, and work and, and practice in their, in their schools. And the one last one I'll mention, alicekeeler.com down there. Uh, Alice Keeler is, 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 is just a tremendous resource, and uh, uh, for particularly for technology and the use of Google in the classroom. And uh, her blogs are, are very, very practical, and very helpful, they're very instructional in terms of problem solving with technology. So uh, I, I would just encourage our, our pre-service teachers to consider 
uh, that they really do have something to offer. Uh, your expertise is growing and evolving, but I think blogging is an excellent way to facilitate that evolution uh, as you as you continue to gain experience out in the classroom. And uh, I've been blogging for about a year and a half now consistently and uh, really enjoy it. Um, and, and I think I've kind of begun to develop a little bit of an audience so that I know who I'm writing for. But I'm still very most concerned about the people closest to me. I write for my students. I write for my fellow faculty members uh, with an eye toward giving them something to think about in terms of particularly of technology in the classroom. OK, thank you. Let's give a virtual round of applause to Dr. McCoy. He teaches at Collegiate um, High School, is that correct, in Arlington, computer science courses. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. OK, great. We're going to turn it over to Dr. Sparks for just a few brief minutes, and then we'll wrap up. Um, Dr. Sparks has posted some links in the chat window, so take it away, Dr. Sparks. I know we're running short on time, so I just wanted to share a couple of things about um, my blogs and why I blog. Uh, the first one, uh, as you can see, there's three different uh, sites that I've used, the Edgy Blogs, um, uh, Blogspot, and WordPress. <clears throat> the first one is one that I used uh, when I became a professor to talk about some issues with, uh, with teachers, uh, science teachers, but uh, other teachers as well. Uh, that's the one I've been the least consistent on. Uh, don't look and see when the last post was. It might have been over a year. But um, the middle one basically uh, was one that I started three years ago, and I had dabbled with uh, writing journals and poetry and things like that. And I decided, well, if I'm going to write it down, I might as well put it out there for somebody, you know, if somebody wants to read it. And uh, that's not necessarily, you know, the main concern. The main concern is that I'm able to share some of the things that I do, if it's poetry, if it's a short writing, if it's just my thoughts on something. Uh, one thing I did do that's interesting is I turned, uh, I made the comments where they had to send a message to me and I had to approve it before the comments were posted because I was getting a little bit of uh, trolling, trolling behavior. Uh, and that will happen. So uh, that you, how you want to set that up is up to you as far as comments go. But the middle one is more of the sanity one, the one that I do uh, just to, to get thoughts out. And when the thought hits me, that's why it's not necessarily regular. It's just because whenever those thoughts hit me and I have time to get those get those written, uh, that's when I publish those. The last one is one <coughs> that I've started uh, just recently. Um, and for academia, as some of y'all may know, you're trying to get things published. Some of y'all can agree, um, the professors. Uh, it, it could be a year, sometimes a year and a half before, uh, by the time you send it in, it's uh, reviewed and then it's published and out uh, in the world. So I'm, I'm starting a, a blog on some of the research that I do on in intersectionality that I can put some of these ideas that I have, some of these uh, terms that I'm, I'm seeing in the research and things that I'm coming up with and get those out there before I get them into academic publications. So I think that's that's the key for a lot of blogging is uh, you may have people that will not necessarily read an academic article, but they will read um, a blog because usually a blog is written in more common language and easier to understand. So I think that's kind of a transition between just uh, common writing in academic writing where you can post some ideas and information out there before you put it into academic publications. And some of these terms that I want to to uh, get credit for at, at some point, uh, I want to get those out there before I get them out in academic publications because, like I said, it can take over a year. But you, uh, feel free to look at these three as examples of, of blogs. And um, like I said, it's it's more of a just a hobby for me. It's nothing that I use. Um, professionally as much, but it is it is a good way to uh, to ab able to share some of the things that are important to you and uh, for sanity just to, to get things out. I will add, be careful if you blog things about your school and make sure that you keep it positive and things like that because, um, you know, it could come back to haunt you if you have negative uh, type blogs uh, professionally. So Awesome. Let's give Dr. Sparks a virtual round of applause and also and Dr. Harrison and Justin Dellinger and everyone, Dr. Robertson that's presented. I'm going to wrap up in just a second, but I love your cautionary note, keep it positive. It doesn't mean that teaching is like Pollyanna-ish, but it does mean we protect the privacy of our students. I tend to never blog about um, my students. 
I put a link in the chat window where all of the links are. I've compiled them on a Google Doc, and so you can click there. And I will post it. I will send it through email too to our faculty who can share the, these links with you guys. So I encourage you to vote in our our poll. Would you consider starting a blog of your own? And feel free to mark yes or no. Feel free to type any comments in the chat window. And finally, we encourage you to share something you've learned with us. So what is a fact or a tip or something you hadn't thought about prior to this session? Go ahead and let's take about 30 seconds to share in the chat window. And I'll post the polling results. So we've got 10 people saying they might think about blogging. Positivity. Me too. I need to be more consistent. I need to read more blogs. That's one of the best ways to learn about blogging is just reading other people's. And so we've shared some with you guys. But let's just take a few more, a few more seconds. And what else are you guys thinking at this point? I've heard of people making schedules. I'm going to turn my video on. I've heard of people making schedules for themselves. So like maybe blog once a week or more often. Um, I know people who blog multiple times a day, that, but some of it is just cutting and pasting um, stuff to pass along, like something they've got in their email or something. Um, and then I love the idea of using your own blog as a model or a mentor. Mentor text is what we call it in literacy. And so having a lot of examples is the best way. Having um, current events to talk about is another great thing. One more thing in your blog post, you want to hyperlink a lot. So you want to connect out to articles or things. People kind of like it when they can click on things and link out to other things on the Internet. And so that would be my other tip is consider the layout of your blog and how you're going to add hyperlinks in it. Um, Mark, Dr. Robertson had a great point that you can Google tutorials on how to set up your blog. So we focused more on the why of blogging, why we do it, and why we read, and why we write. And so I, I like that you guys are sharing what you learned and what you thought. Um, I'm curious as to how math teachers. And so Alicia, what you might do is just Google um, math teacher blogs and just read them and see what you find out about it. I bet that they're sharing resources, lesson ideas, um, technology apps, and tools that might be beneficial. So great. And then consider commenting on other people's blogs, too. Find some good ones to follow, and then comment. So again, let's give kind of a big shout out to all the presenters. Thank you so much. And if you guys want, do you guys want to add anything else as final thoughts? I'd love to see math blogs also. I like um, literacy blogs. I'm kind of like Dr. Robertson. I like to see what people are reading and writing about. Don't forget, Tumblr is another way to blog if some of you are on Tumblr. So great. You can start small and write, you can write short blog posts. They don't have to be essays. So thanks again, everyone. I'm going to stop the recording.